Hello, I'm Eric Light, and you're Inside Corleone. Hello and welcome to Inside Corleone. My name is Eric Light. I'm the artistic director of Corleone Men's Choir based in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. And we are so glad to have you with us this week. Uh, we've got as our special guest, Andrew Fuchs, who is part of the Leonids, a professional ensemble that we are starting to be the headliners for our yearly Van Man Male Choral Summit that we have uh, in the spring. This will be uh, coming up in May. Really excited to be a part of that music making, lots of world premieres happening, composers coming in, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and then just a, a ton of different uh, uh, choirs coming together. Our My Voice program, Corleone, the Leonids, uh, our festival singers all joining together on the stage of the Chance Center here in uh, in British Columbia in at, at UBC, and uh, and singing together. It's it, it's it's really one of the the best weeks of, of of my life, and we haven't been able to do it for a while, so it's. Re- be really good to get back to it. Uh, before we get into that, I want to play a little bit of Corleone uh, in a performance that we did uh, just this last November. It was actually the world premiere version, the t- world premiere TTBB version of a piece by uh, Twin Cities composer Shruti Rajasekhar. Um, funnily enough, uh, she attended high school uh, where I used to teach for two years at Wayzata High School. Uh, was part of the choral program that I was uh, that I taught in for a while. We we figured that out after the fact. So I. The age is, is really starting to show uh, 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 on me here. Uh, but she is an extraordinary young uh, young composer, and uh, she is also uh, very well versed in Indian classical music. And this work is uh, is really a melding of, of 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 these Western choral traditions as well as uh, as as her Indian classical training um, in this setting of "Do Not Stand at My Grave and Weep," a, a, a pretty well known poem um, that. Uh, is very appropriate for our Remembrance Day time, and in this in this work, uh, Shruti has uh, in different sections, depending on some of the imagery that the poem um, talks about. Um, she has set each of these sections in different ragas, in different scale degrees, uh, or in different in, in different um, scalar systems, and it's um, it's really quite amazing how she has uh, uh, used all of these other techniques as this underlying force of the of the composition. It gives each of these sections. I think uh, very different moods and flavors that you feel, and yet it it sounds uh, very much a part of our times. I think in terms of of the choral writing, we really really enjoyed um, singing the premiere of this in the TTBB voices. And uh, without any further ado, we'll play for you now. This is "Do Not Stand at My Grave and Weep." Corleone singing music by Shruti Rajasekhar.
initially, uh, it can be quite sad uh, if you take the uh, initial part, do not stand at my grave and weep. But uh, for me, I think the most important part of the piece is um, <clears throat> the rest of the words and the music that goes with it, which uh, you're part of the wind, um, you're in the autumn leaves, you're in the area around you. And uh, that's exactly how I remember my family members. Um, and this particular piece, um, every time we sang it in rehearsal, and indeed when we sang it in person, because of that, um, I uh, had a hard time not starting to cry. Um, but uh, once uh, we got into the piece, and particularly in uh, the first tenor part that I sing, uh, then it's like uh, my spirit and the spirits of uh, my family members are with me and we're just sort of soaring. Um, and that's what I remember mostly about this piece. Oh, well, I think you can hear in the way we sang it, <laughs> the love that everybody put into this piece. I mean, the resolution, the chord resolutions um, that are the highlight of some of the more romantic sections of this piece are simply luscious and scrumptious. Um, there's just no other way to say it, for me anyway. And when you feel that chord finally, after the tension builds up and then the resolution hits, um, there's this release of energy uh, that the choir picks up on, I think, and projects to our, our wonderful friends in the audience. That was Do Not Stand at My Grave and Weep by Shruti Rajasekhar. That was a new version of that piece that she made, especially for Corleone, in a TTBB uh, version. And I want to also thank Bob Keyes and Eric Christensen for contributing their thoughts about singing that piece as we came back to singing this last fall uh, coming out of COVID. We performed that work at our Remembrance Day program this last November, and it was also featured on our digital program for our Remembrance Day show. So we just uh, feel so uh, so honored to have that new work uh, from Shruti and hope to work with her again. I think she's cool and her music is fantastic. Uh, I am so excited uh, to welcome our guest for the show today. Uh, he has been uh, a part of uh, the vocal ensemble Tenet. He's sung with Seraphic Fire, Clarion Choir, Trinity Wall Street Choir, and he is also now a permanent member of a group uh, called New York Polyphony. Uh, you've heard from them already with uh, Steve Wilson. So I want to welcome to the show Andrew Fuchs. Hello, Andrew. Hi, Eric. It's really great to have you here, and it's really great to actually see you and talk. Um, we've not worked together, and uh, you know, part of the joy of all of this is uh, just you know being some sort of a, a, a internet troll and 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 going around and seeing who's singing well and who might uh, who might be uh, great for uh, for this 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 crazy project that we're creating. And it was just it been so so wonderful for me to get to know your work uh, a little bit. And uh, I, I'm, I'm just I'm just so excited to, to do this. So so thank you for joining us. Where are you joining us from today, if I, if I may ask? Sure. I am in New York City, specifically Jackson Heights, Queens. Uh -huh. uh, it's just a little bit south of LaGuardia. It's a very diverse neighborhood, incredible food options. Like if you want some random Thai curry from a, a unheard of province, this is the place to get it. <laughs> um, so I definitely take advantage of all of the offerings in my neighborhood. I love it very much here. So I've been here for about six years now in Jackson. Oh, fantastic. I want to get down and just, I want to ask sort of a, a big question right off, right off the bat. Um, you've had and are and have a very diverse career um, that you are doing ensemble work, solo work, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you get to weave in and out of different projects and, uh, and different things are asked of you. What's the common denominator? When do you know the music's good? Wait, two questions. Yeah, right. It is, it is, it is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see. The common denominator, I think, for me personally, uh, is just keeping fresh, like staying on top of my voice, my technique. I feel like I do have quite a, a, a range of skills that I do and ensemble stuff, solo things. Um, and I think they really actually work together in many ways. Sometimes they can butt heads a little bit if it's, uh, you know, tessitura demands or, or yeah. 
long stamina things. But in general, I feel like they really do give me an opportunity to kind of cross train in that way. And I, I love You're the CrossFit guy. Yeah. Oh my gosh, not at all. <laughs> um, it, hardly. Uh, so I, I do try to, I mean, I have a, a teacher who I love very much and I'm always checking in and staying on top of just the technical stuff because I feel like without that, um, you know, I know that I can't do a whole lot. So that's kind of my number one thing. The common denominator is just trying to be in as best vocal health as possible. Um, in terms of the music, I guess um, when you when you said you know when do I know the music is good? What what did what were you alluding to in that? Or well, I think there's maybe two things. That, you know, it's like when you're in that moment. Uh, you know, how do you know? And then maybe when you when you stand back from a project or you know mm -hmm. afterwards or what your hopes are, like maybe in terms of what that what you hope that impact is. Yeah, I mean, I th I think in, maybe this is also a little bit related. Actually, another common thread is the interpersonal. Um, vibe of whether it's an, on a huge choral gig, a one and a part ensemble thing, or a mm -hmm. step out solo, whatever. Um, I usually take away with me, you know, how I sang, um, but also how I felt in that arena. And um, I, I feel lucky that after many years of doing this, I can be a little more selective and protective about the arenas in which I enter um, because I yeah. do think that is such a great. That, that can be such um, um, an influential factor in how we perform and how we feel when we're out there on stage. And so um, I know it's a good gig when I feel good up there, you know, and that is like a, there are many parts that come into play with that, but, um, you know, location, fee, people, all these things, the repertoire. But um, I think that that to me is a mark of a, of like a successful gig when I step away and I'm like, wow, I really felt empowered and supported yeah. and I was able to support my colleagues and I felt taken care of and that I was kind of also receiving some support from those around me. Um, I think that more importantly, oftentimes than the actual music that we're singing is what I'm left with. Um, so I, I really lean into that aspect of what we do. Um, it's important to me to have really good connections with who I'm performing with. And, and if we get to sing some great stuff along the way, yeah. all the better. Well, and as I mentioned earlier, you are now a permanent member of New York Polyphony. Yeah. Um, so yes, you get to gig around and all the rest of it, but now you're 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 stuck with those three other guys. I'm uh, married. You know, you're, you're, you're joined at the <laughs> hip, uh, yeah. as uh, as it were. Um, yeah. First, be, uh, first tell us a little bit about uh, this group, and then uh, I want to set up and play for the folks uh, this lovely recording of the Palestrina to us. Petrus. Great. Yeah. So uh, New York Polyphony, I, I keep wanting to say they, but I'm there now. So I guess we, we <laughs> have been around uh, for, I think it's 16 years. And two of the original members, two founding members are still part of the quartet, which is incredible. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, it's it. Let's see. How do I say this? So the baritone who was there for many, many years left and, deci and they decided to kind of put in his place a tenor. I think that was a way to kind of freshen up just the, I don't know, the vocal energy of the group and also to open some doors to different repertoire they haven't been able to do in the past because, For sure. you know, we're very specific in our voicings and there's not a lot of flexibility in that. So I think they were excited to kind of try something new. And I had subbed with them or they had brought me on for a couple of concerts in one recording when they did a piece that needed more than four players or players, four singers. Wow, the New York streets are really alive right now. It's a think. lovely, it gives us some uh, ambiance. I love it. if we have to pause. No, it's great. You know. I like it. Um, so, so yeah, so I, I think it was 2015, they brought me on to do the um, Palestrina Pope Marcellus Mass. And uh, that was just like, when I think back to the most like memorable, incredible experiences of my career thus far, like that is always the top. I just, I had no clue what I was getting myself into when I sang with them on that recording. And it was such like a spiritual experience in a way. Yeah. Um, anyway, that was many years ago. And so now we're uh, alto, tenor, tenor, bass. And we, after COVID, you know, many pandemic postponements and cancellations, we've actually started to concertize again, which has been wonderful. Fantastic. And we're, we're getting back out there, which I'm really excited about. I, I hope that it, you know, really picks up and becomes kind of my main bread and butter because it's such a gratifying experience to sing with those guys. 
That's fantastic. And it's yeah. been fun to get to know them. And on this uh, recording that we're about to uh, uh, play, we have a, a couple of folks that will be joining us yeah. here in Vancouver. So could yeah. you set up um, uh, th this, uh, especially this recording um, of, of, of this wonderful Palestrina work? Yeah. So To Us Petrus is on um, this aforementioned disc, Roma Eterna, which has the Palestrina Pope Marcellus Mass that I was on. Um, and we there was other motets and other pieces. And so um, they put us on this it's for six parts but there are seven of us as one youtuber one very keen youtuber pointed out um so <laughs> a lot of finger wagging yeah, yes, I know. I was like, oh. yes yes yeah. so steve wilson the other tenor he and i kind of share a part we kind of go back and forth and do some deck and canning if you will um, yeah so this is from that recording it's in a beautiful cathedral in omaha nebraska with an incredible um acoustic and uh, you'll also see on the video, I think Jonathan Woody is in the, is in the is. video too. He'll also be there in Vancouver this summer with us, or in May with us. So yeah, some, Fan some familiar faces. Fantastic. This is New York Polyphony, Andrew Fuchs singing with them. And this is Palestrina's extraordinary Duas Petrus. That was New York Polyphony singing Palestrina's wonderful setting, extraordinary setting of Duas Petrus, Andrew Fuchs singing with them. That was just beautiful. And I forgot that that, yes, that I actually know that church in Omaha. Really? What a, what a venue. Oh, it's, yeah, it's yeah. a great place. And because of all the, you know, electricity light buzzes, we had to record very late at night with lamps and in the dark. And it was just like, <laughs> it was so cool. 
<laughs> that was very magical. I love that in recording sessions when you have to turn off the light. You know, you know, maybe you just get like one work light, and it just gives yeah. you all that. It gives you all that like that ambiance. But going candlelight, that's 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 oh, hardcore. No. We had lamps; they were just very quiet oh, okay. lamps. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's good. <laughs> so you had mentioned earlier. Um, tell us a little bit about your path to ensemble singing, especially doing it uh, in a professional way. Wow, you know. Um, it was an avenue that I never knew even existed. I was not, you know, brought up in through schooling with this career in mind. You know, I had great teachers who really knew the opera path that yeah. so many music schools and conservatories, that's kind of, that's what you do. And, you know, no fault of theirs. It just wasn't really on their radar. And so like many young singers who went to a music school, that was kind of what I was heading toward. And uh, it wasn't until I guess grad school, uh, when I went to Stony Brook, which is on Long Island. Um, and one of the great things about that school is it's very close to New York City. So a lot of us, you know, you can kind of start to gig professionally while doing your degrees. And uh, I had some colleagues there in the master's and doctoral program who were like, you know, great voice, good musician, you should sing for these ensemble contractors or these people. And I was like, sure, whatever that is. You know, I really didn't even know that that was like, you get paid to do that. Okay. Right. Um, I'm over here trying to learn Mozart arias and whatever. And it was like, all right, I'll give this a whirl. So, um, I, I mean, I really, I know that there are some people who have very methodical, um, ambitious careers about like, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z and have this career. I really feel like my career has been a series of just doors that have like appeared and I'm like, okay. I'll give that a whirl. Um, right. So I really just fell into it. And, you know, within the network, um, kind of gained more opportunities through who I was gigging with, the other singers who would refer me to conductors and other ensembles. Um, I mean, I really owe a lot of what I do to the people who I worked with because I, I wasn't terribly ambitious, you know, knocking on doors to sing for people. I just didn't even know that that was really what you needed to do for this ensemble world stuff. It just things started to happen and I followed. I mean, the ball was rolling and I was like, well, I'm, people want me in this, uh, this world, so I'll just give it a whirl. Yeah. And it was quite liberating to, I remember one day I just decided to not renew my YAP tracker, which is like a young artist, yes. you know, database where you get all oh, the auditions. Yes, tracker. Yes. And I was like, <laughs> I don't need this anymore. And it was such a liberating experience to, to have that kind of weight of like, you know, pursuing something that I really loved. I mean, I love opera. Um, as a fan and I sing some of it okay but it never really felt like the greatest fit for me and just to kind of own this change was really freeing and um, I hope that moving forward as this you know ensemble solo combined thing takes shape even more and more that we who become teachers maybe one day can start to shift what this career looks like to people who are going through these colleges who maybe are much more suited to what you know my colleagues and myself are doing than trying to like bang their head against the wall you know singing all these other things that maybe they don't feel so great about so i hope that's a shift i hope that's starting to kind of take place yeah i think it's really important that people out there know that you don't have to only have the one path that works for like 10 percent of the people <laughs> you know there is or if if, if that, that yeah, yeah 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 i think you're are, generous on the 10 yeah yeah, yeah. there are um, different ways well, and I think, I mean, I could do a, a, a whole afternoon talking about how um, mu uh, musical education, especially, you know, for your undergraduate, graduate, doctoral programs, um, you know, we, we've we been, th there have definitely been uh, 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 narrow castings of, yeah. of what this is in terms of all of our, all of our learning. Um, and I think it's particular, you bring up, I think, a really interesting point because, um, voices don't develop. You don't even know what this instrument is until you're 26. Sure. Eight, I mean, and people I'm develop still at figuring different it out. times. <laughs> exactly. And so if you haven't, if your voice goes one direction and you haven't developed the skills towards that yeah. and the knowledge of that repertoire, I mean, it's just, um, it, it, it's, it's just sort of insane. So, um, so <laughs> yes. trying to, Trying to make a 19-year-old, you know, say, okay, you're going to be a Mozart tenor, whatever else. Yeah. Who knows that? Well, I, I mean, was a baritone undergrad. I mean, I really right. come a long way. It's just like, you just never <laughs> You've know come a long way, happen. baby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's like, what do I have to work with today? I'll mm -hmm. do my best, you know? Right. And, and again, like I said, I feel like part of it is just following the crumbs that are laid out in front of you by your colleagues or referrals or opportunities and just being open to the uncertainty of what lies ahead because I think that's 
just it's for me it's been such a huge part of kind of not knowing and just going with it you know that's and i just think that is the, that story just needs to be told over and over yeah. again to young hopeful artists because if you if you don't think you've got it all figured out you probably don't, and that's yeah. okay. And that's okay. <laughs> Who has it figured out? Give no. me names. <laughs> yeah, I, nobody. Very, very yeah. few people. Um, uh, I want to shift just a little bit. Sure. You do. You, you, you know, you're singing with a group like New York Polyphony, and that is. I mean, it's one on a part singing, unless you're, you know, trading trading fours with, you know, Stephen right. Wilson on a, right, on, a, right. on a piece. Um, but that ability to um be your voice and bring your artistry into a situation while still working with somebody else in that especially in that one-to-one -one thing not that yeah. there's okay there's eight tenors in the section you're going to make a section sound i think that's a very different animal and i bring this up because we're going to be doing quite a bit of one on a part singing with the repertoire that we've picked for the for the leonids I'm curious as to how do you navigate that maybe emotionally, interpersonally, professionally, etc. of how much of you is in that one uh, that one on a part ensemble singing and how much of that needs to be uh, subjugated to the whole? Well, that's a great question. It's something that I that I most love about one on the part <laughs> blah, word babble <laughs> one on a part singing is that it is this combination of accountability of your own line and what you bring to it. Um, and then also having an awareness of what's happening around you, which sounds kind of dumb, like, <laughs> what, One would think, right? But One yeah. would think. <laughs> but when you're on one and apart, I mean, especially in the kind of things that New York Polyphony sings, this Renaissance a lot, I mean, so much polyphony, which on the page might not look very difficult in terms of range or I don't know what else. Um, it is like a meta. I enter like a meditative trance when I sing that yeah. stuff because you have to be so focused, especially if it's just you on a part. But in general, like I, I kind of I have this very clear image of when I'm singing that stuff of like me kind of sailing along on this kind of conveyor belt, like the music is happening and I'm seeing my part and I also in the periphery kind of picking out pings and dings from my other colleagues and like noticing maybe in advance if it's stuff that we've know very well, I can kind of, you know, predict like, okay, I know here's the octave, I need to be in tune, whatever. But yeah. a lot of it's kind of like, oh, that, okay. Oh, wow. And now we're okay. Now we have these eighth notes moving together. And okay, now we have, you know, a third, I'm, I'm the low third. Okay, what's happening? So there's this constant balance of, yeah, of of myself in my part. I, my, my initial reaction was like, all of me is in my part. What are you talking about? But then, yeah, there is another aspect of like, it's not just what you bring it's about how you're interacting with those around you and i love that that like gets me going i think it's so exciting to be in the moment in performance and you know look up and catch eyes just kind of spontaneously with the person who you're about to enter with if you haven't really rehearsed it yet and your kind of your feelers are out um that is very exciting to me and also very challenging i mean the mental focus is huge and that's you know that can be the first thing to go if you're a little jet lagged or not feeling oh, great man. or distracted by an audience member or the lighting or whatever, a horn outside. Um, <laughs> it really takes some mental fortitude. I, I, I couldn't agree. And, and, and um, you know, you're going to go on the road with a group like New York Polyphony and sing this repertoire over and over and over again. Yeah. And at least I always found that um, when doing that kind of repertoire, um, if you allow yourself to be in that moment, the the amount of discovery you can still have in the twentieth performance yes. of that piece is unbelievable. Uh, you like that that was there the whole time, and like right. you have these revelations that are shared with other people. I and, know. Yeah. Yeah. There's it's, always. I mean, I feel like I should have seen that before, but yeah, like, <laughs> like there's just so much to think about, and you know, I try to be easy on myself. It's like you don't have to know it all you know, in the first or second concert, like, right. I mean, know your notes, of course, but like, do your, yeah, do your job, but yeah, yeah, yeah do yeah, your yeah, job. Yeah. And you'll, like you said, these discoveries will happen. And that's, that's great. That's why we do. That's why these things are still around because people are still finding these things, you know, in these pieces. That's right. And um, I think if we do it right, the audience can be a part of that, that yeah. level of discovery that's both interpersonal, musical, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. It's such a wonderful, the interpersonal, I'm sorry to, no. to keep going. Mm. I mean, one thing that I really love, especially with a group like New York Polyphony or a really high caliber performing group, 
where people are experienced in um, kind of the nuance of singing with other people in that in that very focused, <laughs> exposed way. Like I remember we were recording, we had a retreat this past summer and we were recording some things and sometimes you might have to like raise your hand and be like, oh, I need just a daylight's worth more time before this breath. Or can we just like wait for me here? I have to swallow or whatever the logistics are. <laughs> we do it, you know, yeah. <laughs> You swallow I don't lot. know what the marking on the score is for <laughs> I swallow. I ha okay, it's this is SW. new to me. I'm, I'll give it to I'm you. I'm learning. So SW. Yeah. Okay, I, I, <laughs> it's all over yes. my scores. But you know those those kind of <laughs> mechanics, which are kind of like mundane but really important. Um, if you're working at a really high level with colleagues who are also aware of those things, those are the little things that just happen, and that's so nice to not yeah. have to ask for those things. It's like you know a relationship where the other person can kind of sense what you need and that's just such a great feeling when you're in a concert and like oh maybe you're like oh i'm running out of air i need to really like take a, a half second longer breath you know we're here to catch each other in that way and i love that i think it's such a great collaborative spirit especially in performance when you, you might not suspect it to happen that's right and i and i'm a firm believer that ensemble singing um when done right can lead to this generosity yeah. of spirits that we one would hope would carry into the rest of our lives yeah concentric uh, circles yes. yeah right yeah. right um so we've created this leonid's roster and you've sung with some of the folks that are that are coming here to vancouver you've not sung with some other ones impressions about uh your or, or apprehensions maybe oh. uh fears uh you know excitements what 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 about this this sort of project when i approached you and pitched it uh made you say yes well i mean I think it's such an exciting idea of, uh, it is a larger ensemble in terms of, I mean, usually we have like a quartet or a quintet, but to have, are there nine of us, I think, or, nine. is that right? Yeah. Yep. That's, that's remarkable, you know, and if it's going to be one apart stuff, um, that's, it's such a great opportunity to kind of experience that kind of music making in a different way with this incredible lineup. I mean, like you said, I've, I have sung with, I think everyone except for maybe one or two people in some way at some time right um but i, I of course i know of everyone if, if not know them personally and it's wow like good job eric i i think you've done a great job in like what i did over the cast. pandemic by eric light yes <laughs> <laughs> right youtube stopped a lot of singers um yeah i mean it's just i i feel really excited to be in the same room with these great guys and and try something new you know this yeah. is a a dynamic and even though you know even though we have sung together many of us before in other in other, other places it doesn't mean that like this is going to be like the same as those other experiences you know we're in a new place right. there's a new there's new blood in the, in the mix it's it's its own thing and that's i love that about kind of this incestual pool that we do have for freelance singers like we do see each other a lot in other gigs but it's but each each arena has its own flavor its own mo you know yeah. and i think that's something really great and i'm i mean i am astounded by how ambitious this festival is going to mean like there's so much going on and i think like i think it's like such a huge um undertaking in a great way to have all of these little different avenues part of the whole experience so yeah yeah, I mean, my hat's off to you for putting it together, and I'm super stoked to just now. We just have to do it. Yeah, see what yeah. happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, just, just that little thing. Just um, that part. That's that's yeah. the easy part. After like <laughs> everything else is, flights are booked and programs are set. You know, once you yeah, a lot of times once you get the the bowling pins set up, it's you yeah. know knocking them down is that that is that that is the fun part. Yeah. Um, and I, Lord knows, I'm I, I'm I'm looking forward to that. Um. And, and as you say, I you know I, the analogy I sort of have right now with where we're at with ensemble singing in North America is that I feel like there's Legos, right? You know, and you're yeah. you're 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 and and you can take these Legos and you can build anything, but you know you have these different singers and you're going to make something different each time you put those those sometimes those, uh, different combinations of those sometimes same pieces together, yeah. and yeah. Uh, uh, that's what I'm that's what I'm hoping that's what I'm hoping for. Um, in terms of the repertoire, uh, you've got a chance to look at all of it. Anything stand out for you uh, as far well, as Well, I have to start learning about? some different languages that I haven't yes, sung in you're before. you're Estonian. You have a big yes, solo in Estonian. I do. Yes. I mm -hmm. think I've sung in, like, maybe once in Estonian. So, I mean, I love that part of it. I love diction. I love languages. So that's always very exciting to me. There's some new works that I'm pumped about. I mean, I love approaching 
new music, especially without the pressure of like, you know, well, the best recording of this piece is yeah. the 1975 version of this. 500 years of history yeah. or whatever. Who cares? Do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. that can be kind of a an unwanted <laughs> pressure sometimes when, you know, there's this, um, I don't know, lineage of a piece. So to be able to approach some music without any history is, I love that. That's one of my favorite things to do. Yeah, and that was part of my jam too, is like, let's make a fun once a year thing where you all get to come out to beautiful Vancouver and and then do some stuff that you just don't get to do otherwise. So especially, we have a lot of early music singers, and so I'm like, let's just do new music, because, you know... It, <laughs> they go it, hand in hand, usually. You know? And in some ways, they they actually really do, I think, with, yeah. the, with the way people are writing. Um, but it will ask, I think, for some different vocal colors and some, you know, just in, and other musical challenges as well. Some of this of music course. is just really flipping hard. Well, um, send me a little asterisk list so I know what to, uh, <laughs> to look at first. <laughs> I, I will. I'll be like, if you haven't looked at this yet, right. you're behind uh behind. So, yeah, yeah so i'll i'll do that um i want to ask you one more question before we uh, uh play one more work of you singing um this festival and this project with the leonids yes it's born out of uh tr let's see if we can put together this group and sing this music in this way and we certainly want to have the collaborations with corleone and and right. and all the rest of it but i think for me when an enormous part of all of this is the educational aspects and the outreach things that we're going to be doing with our young singers in our emerging choral artist program and our my voice program um You've been on both sides of this. You've been a young singer that's probably gone to a festival, and you know, what 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 sort of impact uh, out of out of a, a sort of week long thing like this would you hope to have, maybe for you personally or or for the project in general? I think one of the great things about having a mixed ensemble in terms of like professionals and um, non professionals is that there is a lot of learning that can happen on both. In, in both directions, you mm -hmm. know, and one of my, I mean, I sing with a lot of mixed ensembles in that, in that respect. And I love the, just the interpersonal connections, of course. I mean, it's so nice and necessary and refreshing to talk to humans who do not have this bonkers career who are like i have this job like what do you mean you're you don't you have how many tax forms what does that even mean so like just to interact with like muggles if we can go harry potter for I, a second i totally understand what yeah, you're saying yes i think that's really important for perspective um and it's also such a great way to um you know this interconnect this interconnection is great to help them feel like they're part of our world for two weeks or you know a month every year whatever whatever it is like yeah. for them I mean, they're here because they love music right and they love singing sure. and, and i think it's so important not only for just the the greater um impact of that project but for them to to like you know live out their musical their lives musically by getting excited about going to see things or like supporting the arts or whatever like that's such a great important um uh, relationship I also think it's wonderful in those capacities to lead by example. And I feel like that's something that I do quite well in these mixed worlds of, yeah. you know, maybe not like directly saying like, oh, here, how I would sing that. But, you know, to, to show up and do your job well and to set a standard that if everyone around you has their feelers out and their awareness open, um, you know, they might learn something just by us being there in the room, you know, without having to be very that osmosis, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. as long as they're, as long as you know, that's on their radar and ours too. I mean, I learned so much by just watching people, you know, for for the better or the worse. Um, I think that's such a huge part of what we do is just setting a great example in demeanor, in sound, in work ethic, in attitude, um, and I think that is, yeah, I think that's going to be really fun just to to be with everyone there <laughs> and yeah. and see how we work together and hopefully we'll all learn from each other in, in one way or another whether very overtly or maybe more osmosis or so yeah. subconsciously or all you know all of the hopefully yeah, all, all of the, the above, above right yeah yeah it is it is amazing to me that we're going to bring such a diverse crew of people together uh with different um experience levels for some of these young singers it's going to literally be their first choral concert ever wow. which is extraordinary 
And then folks like, you know, they were bringing Eric Alatori in. I mean, for the love of God, what hasn't right. he done in, in, in this world? Yeah. And what's amazing to me is we're actually, we're all going to do the same thing. Yeah, it's kind of an equalizer, isn't it? <laughs> isn't that great? Like, where else does that happen in life? Yeah. Uh, that, you know, yeah, maybe we could all go bowling and some of us are going to get better <laughs> scores or, or, or whatever. But uh, uh, yeah, that 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 is um, that is truly extraordinary that we're going to be singing the same music and yeah. uh, that it becomes um, something something else uh, different. Yeah. So I'm I am so looking forward to it. And uh, I think the this perspective and this this attitude and this love of what you're doing and the way that we can share this and the way we can do this together the way that you're saying all of this boy is it just it kind of gives me all the tingles and oh, I, I can't wait so yeah thank you um wow. i want to play one more piece for folks of of you singing with new york polyphony and i'm gonna tell you this it's not very often that i see something and i see a composer's name and i've like literally <laughs> never heard of this cat so yeah. could you please introduce uh when evening's twilight to us and and give us uh, just a couple nuggets of of how to hang our hat on on what we're listening to here sure i too had no idea who this person was um our countertenor is the artistic kind of genius behind the group and he just handed out a handed out a, a piece and i was like okay here we go we're gonna sing this so i had you know i, I was like who was this person but he uh if, let's see john liptrot hatton yes liptrot liptrot right yes yes liptrot yeah he was a 19th century british victorian composer um also a singer and from what i gathered an extraordinary accompanist um, just kind of a jack of all trades. He wrote operettas, a lot of part songs, comic songs. At one time, he like came on tour to the states and performed with Stephen Foster. Um, so I feel like why don't we know more about this <laughs> this composer? Because he really has a huge output. Um, and this piece, When Evening's Twilight, is it's kind of like a a fireside little yeah. gem. It's very comforting and warm and sweet. This nocturnal, you know, serenade of sorts about. Um, you know, when, when evening is here, that's when I'll think of you. So it's a little cheesy in that way, but I think it's very lovely and, and oh, sweet and heartfelt. simple in, in many ways. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, yes, John Liptrot Hatton. You heard it here. Uh, <laughs> Hope to see more here. of you. Yes. And I'm, I'm actually going to go look because I'm <laughs> yeah. just like, what is, what, what is, is this? this? But it's a, and it's a beautiful piece and certainly yeah. of that era. Uh, it's sung extraordinarily by New York Polyphony. I want to thank Andrew for joining us. Um, I'm hoping, I just, just can't wait to get to make music with you and hoping all the folks uh, uh, here in the local Vancouver area We'll be able to come out and, and, and be a part of what you what you have to, to offer us. So thank Great. you. Thank you, Eric. It's been a pleasure. I can't wait. This is When Evening's Twilight, sung by New York Polyphony.
That was When Evening's Twilight, sung by New York Polyphony. Andrew Fuchs was singing with them. A beautiful, beautiful piece. New to me. I loved it. I'm uh, so excited to be talking to the folks that will be part of the Leonids, this new professional ensemble that we're creating for our Van Man Festival. If you want to sing with us at the Van Man Festival, uh, there are links below that you can click on to register for, uh, for that festival, part of that weekend in May. It's a really extraordinary time of, of fellowship, of music making, of learning, sharing, and growing. Um, I, I feel really proud to be a part of that. We'll be back in a couple of weeks with uh, talking to a few more of the Leonids. I wish you all the best. Uh, happy spring if it's coming to you. And we'll see you next time. Oh.